Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here today at the Sunshine Cathedral via the website. And we want to welcome you to our worship services whenever you're in the Fort Lauderdale area. If you are in the area, we invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We're located at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. And for those who watch us weekly on the internet, we invite you to check our website often for other listings and programming that we might have that may be of interest to you. And for now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Our second reading is from the wisdom of Wendell Berry. We clasp the hands of those that go before us and the hands of those who come after us. We enter the little circle of each other's arms and the greater circle of lovers whose hands are joined in a dance and the larger circle of all creatures passing in and out of life. We move also in a dance to a music so subtle and vast that no ear hears it except in fragments. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our third reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts bring peace and blessing to our spirits. Amen. Amen. In the chapter that ends with our gospel text this morning, Jesus and his followers are in the midst of a whirlwind missionary trip to many of the seaside towns of the Galilee region. And so he gathers his disciples and shares with them his plan to split them into smaller groups that are each empowered to travel to different towns in the area to continue the work on their own. He gives them what amounts to a sobering yet encouraging pep talk. They're going to do all the great things that they've seen Jesus do, but they're also going to run into a lot of the same resistance that Jesus has faced. They are to take heart, to be bold, and trust that as they go out, God's Spirit goes with them. Whatever the actual origin of this particular Jesus tradition, the author's larger purpose in including it in the story is to serve as an encouragement to the community of Christians who were the first readers of this gospel. It is as though Jesus is reaching across the years through the written page and is speaking directly to the experience and concerns of the early church community as it struggled to live out its purpose in challenging and dangerous times. Thus, it would seem to make sense that Christian communities today look to Jesus' words here to both guide and interpret their own experience, living out their purpose in a challenging world. However, we must be careful, here as elsewhere with Scripture, not to abandon our appreciation of the text as reflecting a particular writer speaking to a particular audience at a particular time and place. We should not, as too many Christian communities do, conceive of the words on the page as something God supernaturally caused to be written down millennia ago just so you and I could read it today. Far too often, the result of this faulty and egocentric thinking is that Christian movements hijack scripture to give divine legitimacy to their own sense of entitlement and privilege as the so-called special people of God. Just from this 10th chapter of Matthew, Christians have been emboldened to reach all manner of worrisome conclusions. Jesus says, whoever doesn't accept what we have to say is going to suffer fiery judgment. 
Jesus says, when we're standing up to those who oppose us, anything we say is really God speaking through us. Jesus says, if anybody says bad things about us, it's because they actually hate him. Jesus says, even if our behavior hurts people in our own families, we must ignore their pleas if we want to be worthy of Jesus. And so on and so forth. Until all manner of bad behavior is given spiritual sanction, every plea to elevate love falls on closed ears, and every effort to protect the innocent becomes an assault on their so-called religious liberties. Just like Jesus said. And the heart-wrenching irony is that this corruption of the gospel of Jesus Christ lies at the heart of so much of the oppression, violence, and degradation that has been and unfortunately continues to be perpetrated in the name of Christianity. And so we must not make the mistake of concluding that Jesus is encouraging Christians to see themselves as part of some sort of special group that can act with divinely sanctioned impunity. But that is not to say that Jesus' words here do not have something to say to us today. When we resist the temptation to see Jesus' words as a celebration of Christian privilege, we are then free to recognize that Jesus is in truth speaking about the special purpose of the church, not its special position. Specifically, as we listen in on Matthew's Jesus telling his followers, what being sent out as gospel bearers really means. We are inspired by the idea that both begins and in our text concludes his speech. It is the idea that the gospel is advanced, that God shows up when strangers welcome one another into their respective worlds. Again, we do not take the text literally here. Rather, we step back and see the broader principle Jesus is articulating. In a world where we so often close ourselves off from what is strange to us, what is unfamiliar, what is discomforting, so often what we are really closing ourselves off from are the opportunities to make connections with others, opportunities that may very well reveal God's love in surprising and powerful ways. In so many areas of our lives, we resist what is foreign to us, different ideologies and different ideas. It's not enough that we stake out a position, an attitude, or a preference that works for us and that we're happy with. We find it necessary to completely shut out competing ideas and notions. Once we make up our minds about something, we so often refuse to believe that there is any value whatsoever in even taking time to consider alternatives that may subsequently cross our paths with an open mind. And our consumption-based culture reinforces this predilection. Our food, our music, our entertainment, all customized to our precise tastes. We don't even consume news anymore without filtering out perspectives that are different from our own. So much of our life experiences can be dialed into our exact specifications, like building a burrito at Chipotle. It's even spilled over into how we form relationships. Look at where we've gotten with these dating apps that so many of us use now, straight or gay. They allow you to filter out and not even have to see people based on age, race, height, weight, health, hair color, hair amount, hair location. You can basically avoid the awareness that people outside of your limited preferences even exist. What's next? A dating app that allows me to simply accept or reject someone in the blink of an eye based upon my gut reaction to their picture? No, 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 yes, no, right, left, right, oh wait, they've got that now too. Or so I've been told. All joking and dating apps aside, we probably miss out on the opportunity to welcome in and be welcomed in to one another's space more often than we'd like to admit. And it's because of this discomfort we feel, this sense of otherness we experience with so many people who are not like us, who are not part of our same groups, who think about and value and experience life very differently than we do. There are so many distinctions between us as people that naturally dictate who we are more or less likely to welcome in. If we're being honest, that often includes things we wish or would like to believe it didn't. Things like race, 
gender, sexual orientation in either direction, disability status, class, nationality, language, immigration status, criminal history, political and religious differences. This is not new to our time and context. It has always been part of the human condition. It certainly was in Jesus' day, and I imagine he thought a lot about this. I suspect he was a realist enough to know that the way the world worked only reinforced people's tendencies to otherize difference and to reserve radical welcome only for the familiar and the safe. But I also think Jesus dared to imagine something different. I think he recognized that what was truly a threat to people's welfare and quality of life was not the discomfort of difference or strangeness, but the systems of oppression and dehumanization fueled by the reality of empire. We've heard plenty from this pulpit about how Jesus' message of the kingdom of God, the gospel itself, was a counter-kingdom alternative to empire. And I believe Jesus' missional instructions to his followers that day, as he prepared to send them out on their own, reflect that very same message. He says in our passage this morning, you want to see God show up in surprising places where only injustice and oppression and lack seem to have been present before? Then welcome the prophet. Welcome the righteous. Welcome the stranger in need with compassion. In ancient Israel, the prophet was someone who spoke discomforting, disrupting truth to power. And the righteous in our translation is, the Greek word there means both righteousness and justice. They are kind of interchangeable in both the Greek and the Hebrew. So really, Jesus is telling us to welcome one another's truth, even when it disrupts or discomforts our own assumptions and privilege. He's telling us to embrace the claims that others have for justice, regardless of whether we see the connection to our own need for justice or not. He's telling us to welcome the one to whom we owe nothing by sharing ourselves to meet their need. This is much easier said than done today as it was then. It's so much easier to dismiss what we don't understand or agree with than to be open to being changed by someone else's truth and experience. I think about what's been going on this past Pride season. I hear about somebody wanting to add stripes to the Pride flag or disrupting Pride parades, and my first reaction maybe is to dismiss that as ridiculous, to get agitated by it. It's so much easier for me just to reiterate my own logic and arguments on, whatever, on it whenever the subject comes up. But how does that result in anything other than me being divided from people in my own community? from having animosity toward those with whom I should be in solidarity with against the structural wrongs that affect us all. How much more might be gained if instead of digging in and reacting solely from my own truth, I began by intentionally hearing the voices of those who have a different truth to tell from their own experience about the inclusivity of pride and the LGBTQIA community. Maybe it changes my opinion to hear them. Maybe it doesn't. But by making room within myself to fully welcome someone's differing, discomforting truth, it changes me, and it changes them. And most importantly, it changes who we are to one another. And with that kind of change, no matter how subtle, the God of liberation and love always shows up. Anytime we offer or receive welcome in unexpected places where the result is that we have become more human to and with one another, God has shown up. I want to share a final story from my own life that for me illustrates the truth of this perfectly. When I was about 13, my mother came to visit my younger brother and I at our dad's house just one day after she had been released from prison. For reasons I won't get into, my mom ended up having to take my brother and I with her that day, like permanently, along with our clothes and my dog, Silver. This was unexpected, and I'm not sure where my mom had been planning on staying that night, but now she had us, and new plans had to be made. She had a car that she had gotten from somewhere, but the windows didn't roll up, and so we couldn't sleep in it even for just that first night. We went straight to the welfare office. They got my mom signed up for assistance, but all they could do for housing was give us a list of shelters to try. 
The only one that had space at that last minute was an old church in Venice Beach. There were no beds, and people were sleeping on and underneath the pews. There were three spaces available for us underneath the pews on the floor, but they weren't together, and the entire church smelled badly of booze and urine. My brother and I cried openly, insisting that we could not stay there. Unconcerned about how much more difficult our insistence made the situation for our mom, with no one, including my grandparents, willing to or able to give us a place. At some point, my mom had no choice other than to call the one person with a house and the heart to possibly help us. His name was Nate, but everyone called him Nationwide. Nationwide was a crack dealer, and his home was a crack house. Nationwide's house had no electricity and no water service. This was in the days before the batter ram where cops could just tear through the front wall of a suspected crack house. So what they did to discourage drug activity was they had the city cut off power and water. We got to Nationwide's house, and he had his candles lit all over the house and a makeshift bed of sheets and pillows he had made on the floor for us. And he even had food and water for silver. He had kicked out all of his customers so that we would feel safer. And for the next week, Nationwide went with little to no income while we stayed in his home until my mom was able to get us into a motel. This was the 80s, and I'd been flooded with negative stereotypes of what a crack dealer was, how they were violent, crazed, how they preyed on children and were the scourge of civilized society. But I experienced someone totally different than that. Nationwide was no saint, but he was to me, and my brother, and my mom, and my dog. I have no idea if his act of welcoming us in with radical compassion when where we had nowhere else to go changed him in any way. But it absolutely changed me in a permanent way. To this day, I cannot just write people off as bad or no good because of what society or even other people have to say about them. Not since that day when God showed up for me and it turned out he was black and old and almost toothless. He lived by candlelight, and his bathroom was a hole in the backyard. He survived by selling crack cocaine, and his name was Nationwide. When we welcome the stranger into our lives in meaningful ways, when we allow their truth to penetrate our sense of what's what in the world, when we take up their cries for justice and compassion as if they were our own, then we also welcome God. Spaces that once seemed to be filled only with struggle and lack and the domination of empire suddenly become fountains of hope and promise, of liberation and love. The cultivation of such spaces, whenever and wherever we are able, is indeed both the purpose and the privilege of the church. It is the great work of the kingdom of God, and it is the good news. Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.